Redline logbook here for part 10 of the Hestia Familia. Where we left off, the Xenos got exposed to the surface, Wing died, was resurrected, and now the Xenos are trapped on the surface with the Loki Familia hunting them. Bell is now the pariah of all of Aurorio. This is because Bell, to save Ween, had to make himself look like he was trying to get a valuable item from killing a wyvern. As a result, he actively fired magic at other adventurers, putting them in danger. So he's now well known as a selfish bastard who put money above the lives of innocent people. As a result, no matter where he goes in the city, he is now a pariah and well hated by everyone. But the two interactions that hurt him the most was the one with Ina and the ones with the kids from the church. The ones with Ina was very simple. She asked him if it were true that he was attacking other adventurers to get a rare item drop. He said, yes, this is true. And she slapped him and told him that she can't believe that, that that can't be true. She hugs him, but then after that, that's basically how their conversation ends. That definitely hurt Belle, but it gets even worse because the kids of the church, their reaction was vastly worse. When he tried to interact with them, they basically threw insults at him, told him that he wasn't an actual hero, he wasn't a real adventurer, basically called him a coward and just wanted nothing to do with him. This is a big deal because these kids looked up to Belle as a hero, as something that they wanted to grow up to be, and Belle knew that, and so when they rejected him, this just crushed Belle. When Hestia saw the harassment and hatred at Belle by the townspeople, she did her job as a goddess where she declares that Belle was only doing what he did to help reduce her debt that she caused, and this was only proof of his love for his goddess. The mortals have a tendency not to understand the will of the gods, and so when a god basically declares something like this, most mortals take it as, yeah, that makes sense. Obviously, that wasn't going to fly this time, but it did help Bell emotionally knowing that his goddess was behind him. Around the time when Bell and Hestia were wandering around, they actually bumped into eyes. Bell and Eyes both wanted to talk to one another, but Loki, of course, broke that up immediately. She had her reasons to keep eyes with Bell at this moment, but we'll worry about that with the Loki familiar videos. Instead, Loki and Hestia sent Eyes and Bell in opposite directions, and the two of them had a talk together. Hestia informed Loki that these are sentient monsters called Xenos, and basically gave the entire story and what's going on. Loki's response to this was, I don't care. There was no way Loki was going to let these monsters sneak by and get away with it. And the reason for this wasn't because of Loki cared about the monsters, or didn't care about the monsters. She didn't care at all. All that mattered to her was Finn, and what Finn wanted. And Finn's desire was basically to bring the Prom race back to glory again. And if he was caught colluding with monsters, as Bell basically was, he'd be brought down to the same place that Bell is right now, ruining all of his hard work that he's been doing for decades now. Loki understood Finn couldn't risk that, and there's no way she was ever going to ask Finn to risk that for some monsters she didn't care about. And she basically explained that straight to Hestia's face. Now, Loki also explained that she has no interest of messing up Hestia's plans either. She basically told her that she was going to step back and let Finn handle everything. And if the monsters escape, they escape, but if they die, they die. At the same time these two gods are talking, Bell, all by himself at this point, wanders into Finn, who is also just wandering around Daedalus Street. Finn at this point starts to ensure Bell that he doesn't hate him, nor does he think his actions were unhonorable like everyone else does. He just doesn't understand them, and he wishes to understand Bell, where he's coming from, what he's thinking, how does he feel, and how can they help each other. Bell is beginning to be swayed by this and is actually about to tell Finn about the Xenos. That's when Hermes shows up, grabs Bell, and whispers into his ear that Aranos told him about the Xenos and that they can't trust the Loki Familia. And Hermes basically offered to continue their conversation with Finn, but Finn obviously is smart enough not to have a conversation with a god. And so the conversation between the two basically ended there. But the last thing Finn said was, Bell, do you have a key? Bell first didn't know what he was talking about, but then realized he's talking about a key to Noxus. And then Finn walked away. After that, it became quite clear for the Hestia Familia that they were going to have to sneak the Xenos back into the dungeon. And they're going to have to go through Noxus to do it. Now they had allies, they had Oranos, and they had Hermes. But for the most part, this was going to have to be on their backs. They were going to have to be the ones to do this. But they had two advantages. One, they had Fells. And two... They thought Hermes had the Journal of Dionysus, he did not, but they believed he did, and that's what mattered. And so, using Fels' magic items combined with the notebook that was given to them, their plan was to sneak the Xenos back underground. Now, the place that Bell and his group got their magic items was a little magic shop run by a woman that looked like a witch. Leona, the proprietor of the witch's secret house. And also, a servant of Fels. Her family, for many generations, has actually held in the back of their store a secret room filled with magic items that Fels created, but Fels has never actually came to get them. In fact, no one has. This was the first time 
in centuries that someone, Bell and his party, showed up with the password that gave them access to the back room. She was actually quite delighted to meet allies of Lord Faust, actually, and she was really happy to help them. She immediately recognized Bell as the boy who, you know, did what he did, and everyone hates now, but once he revealed that he was an ally of Faust, she didn't care. She knew he was a good man, and that's all that mattered. So they got their magic items. One was robes that allowed them to turn invisible. Two was a flower that uh, created illusions. Three were a bunch of crystals that were communication devices. And four was some ink. The way this works is you add your blood to the ink. You then stick a quill into the ink and then you hover the quill over a map. And the map will then coordinate exactly where you are on location in the real world. So they got a map of Daedalus, put the quills over it, and each member of the Xenos that added their blood, plus the Hestia Familia, were now trackable at a command center while being commanded to move around using the communication crystals. And finally, Crozo Magic Swords. Yeah, for the last five days, Welf has been able to create four magic swords. Three ice swords and one wind sword. Now, one of the ice swords is actually extremely powerful. He put a a lot of work and effort into that one and Wolf is actually afraid to even use that one. He split the magic swords between him and Mikito. He kept the more powerful ice one and a normal ice one and he gave her the wind sword and the another ice sword. With everything ready and set up, the mission was a go. So the plan starts out with using Bell as a decoy because it isn't just the Loki familiar out there, it's pretty much everyone. Every adventurer out there wants to catch these monsters because the guild put a pretty big bounty on them. And so this whole city isn't stupid. They know that Bell Canal is connected to these monsters in some way, and so they're all currently targeting Bell. Finn, of course, isn't stupid. He realizes that Bell is going to be used as a decoy. As such, he decides to only post eyes on him. So the distract the Loki familiar with Bell plan basically just fails right then and there. While Bell is waiting for the signal, he gets visited by multiple women in plain view of eyes, and uh, as you can imagine, he starts freaking out because of this. The first one is Naza. She was told by Miak to help Bell in any way she can. She has no idea about the Xenos, though. Bell gives her the flower that causes hallucinations. Next up is Ryu and Aisha. They were informed about the Xenos by the Loki Familia, because Aisha is a part of it, and Ryu is basically Bell's guardian at this point. Neither of them care about the monsters, but they do care about Bell, and so they decided to aid him in rescuing the Xenos. After they confirm their to help, Aisha then reminds Bell that he still owes her her payment, and she begins to grab him again. Ryu attacks her, stop that from happening, and basically the two of them just run off fighting each other. Bell is now losing his mind. Simple fact that he now looks like a womanizer in front of eyes. This gets even worse because that's when Ina then shows up and she straight up yells at Bell saying, what kind of woman do you take me for? Why didn't you come and see me? As loud as she could. Now, this has to do with the simple fact that she slapped him earlier and yelled at him and she now wants the two of them to actually have a proper talk with one another. But out of context, it just sounds like he did it and then ditched. Bell's now super worried about eyes, thinking that he's now a womanizer. Also, all the other adventurers that are around spying on Bell now hate his guts even more than they did before. Ina tries to get answers out of Bell, but then the signal is made, the howling of the monsters, and he just takes off. Bell rounds a few corners, does what he does, basically making sure he's out of sight for a second by all the adventurers. Naza then uses the flower and all the adventurers are hit by it and start going nuts. Thinking that they're seeing the armed monsters or even Bell himself, basically they fall for the trap. The only person who's unaffected is Eyes, but Bell has an invisibility cloak and he's able to slip away. But once again, Eyes is a level 6. She has enhanced hearing to the point where she can literally hear his footsteps. She quickly realizes he's invisible and goes straight for Bell. Ryu cuts her off, glowing with the power of a level 5 now because of level boost, and challenges Eyes. This allows Bell to successfully get away. So their plan has two parts. One, all the Zenos have been split up into multiple groups. They're now howling at each other to center into one area. At the same time, Lily is using her transformation magic to get information on the Loki Familia. Now, when all the Zenos are able to meet up, they have Mikito and Wealth there in invisibility cloaks, basically as their protectors. The first thing they had to protect them from is the Amazon sisters. They attack head-on. Wealth and Mikito use their ice swords against them, 
and it basically has no effect. They're surprised for a second, but quickly smash through the ice like it wasn't even there, and head straight for the Zenos, start pounding away at them. That's when Mikito realizes she has to use the Wind Sword, does a swipe, and it launches the Amazon Sisters across Daedalus. Now that the Amazon Sisters are gone, up next is Garth. They use both the Ice and the Wind Swords against him, but unlike the Amazon Sisters who got blown away by the Wind Sword, Garth is able to hold steady. He is the strongest member of Loki Familia after all. Wealth and Mikito then realize how screwed they are with Garth, so Mikito releases some smoke bombs. With the area covered in smoke, the plan is for all the Zenos just to sneak past him somehow. This, of course, is not going to work. He has enhanced hearing, and he's an experienced fighter, so he immediately starts crushing the Zenos. Wealth then decides he's going to handle Garth all on his own and starts blasting him with all of his ice magic he has. Then, out of nowhere, Subaki screams test fire and blasts Garth with some ice magic of her own. Subaki does know about the Zenos. She was informed by Hephaestus and basically and asked her to help Wealth. And as a result, the two of them have the same exact idea. Use magic swords that aren't deadly. Subaki is able to sense that Welf has a very powerful magic sword at his waist, but he's not choosing to use it because he's afraid it might kill Garth. And she basically says, no, he'll, he can handle it. He's a tough old man. Welf uses this sword, and surprisingly enough, it only freezes half of Garth's body. So yeah, he could handle it, and he actually starts to break out of it. The guy's a full-on monster. He does mention that it has the same level of power of Reveria when she's holding back. Which means at this point, Welf's craftsman skill is on par with a repressed level 6 elf in magic. Which means he is getting one step closer to his goal of being next to Hephaestus. But yeah, Sabaki and Welf are forced to hold down Garth while Mikito leads the rest of the Zenos out of there. As for Lily's part of the mission, she successfully disguises herself as Finn, goes to who she knows is the most gullible member of the Loki Familia, Raul, and basically tricked him in re to reveal all of the Loki's familiar's locations and knowledge of the dungeon of Noxus. The Loki Familia knows of uh, four out of six of the entrances and are currently blocking all of them. And so the Hesse Familia decides to head towards the fifth unknown entrance to Noxus. Unfortunately, Ween is heading in the wrong direction. During the chaos with Garth, she ends up getting split up from the rest of the Zenos and is currently heading towards the Amazon sisters. Both Haruhime and Bell go off to save Ween. The first individual that Ween ends up interacting with is Tiona, actually. Tiona doesn't really have it in her to kill the Zenos. She feels like there's something off, but she still has a job to do, and so she half-heartedly goes to chase her down. That is, until she sees Ween do something that makes her finally make up her mind on what she thinks of the Zenos. A stone bridge starts to collapse and is about to fall on one of the children that Belle is friends with, and Ween saves her. After witnessing that, Tiona then decides just to let Ween go. That's when Belle finally met up with Ween and also Hirohime, and all three of them were then heading to Noxus. But that's when Bet showed up. He was able to hear across the entire city, which is insane, and he immediately picked up on Belle and went straight for him. Hirohime then threw the invisibility cloak over Belle and Ween and told them to go and she'd handle Bet. When she revealed herself to Bet, Bet then demanded that the others come out as well. She claimed that there is no one else with her, she's alone. This continued on until Bet kicked the ground and shot stones at her, cutting her cheek. The first time was back when she was still part of this Char Familia. Then she basically was crying and on the verge of collapse and Bet actually felt sorry for her and let her go. This time, he's still looking down on her because she's quivering in fear as she's staring him down, but she's showing at least some resistance this time, which Bet actually respects, and this actually works at stalling Bet because he can't just run her over and then go straight for Bell. He has to, you know, show his dominance. Get her either to make the first move or to back down. Haruhime does make the first move. She starts to chant a magic spell, and it's her level boost. She gives it to Aisha, and her and Bet start to fight. Bet then mocks Haruhime, saying that she still needs someone else to fight her battles for her. Belle and Ween are actually getting pretty far before Ai shows up. She defeated Ryu quite easily and tracked Belle down. Eyes then immediately attacks Ween. Just straight up goes to kill her. Bell then does something that he thought he'd never do. He fired Firebolt at his idol, the one he loves the most. Attacking Eyes is something that just shakes him to his very core. He can't believe that he was willing to do something like this. Ween continues to run away, and Bell and Eyes officially have their fight. And Bell gets just beaten the shit out of. Bell tries to use everything he has, his speed, his training from Eyes and others, to do whatever he can, but nothing is getting through. And Eyes is still holding back, because every time Bell is hit by her sword, 
It's the flat of the blade, so this way she doesn't actually cut him. While she's beating the shit out of them, Belle is just begging her to understand that Ween and the other Zenos are people. They have feelings. They can laugh. They can love. They can cry. They can feel fear. They can feel hope. They have dreams. And Eyes isn't hearing any of it. Monsters are evil and they have to die. And she's consistently begging him to get out of the way so she can do her job and she can kill Ween. And Belle is constantly yelling back at her, no. The two are just completely lost in their emotions at this point. Belle is freaking out. Eyes' solid face that she normally has is just breaking down. She's losing her composure. These two just don't want to be doing this. They don't want to be hurting each other. But it's happening. It's, it's something that they chose to do. Neither of them were forced to do this. Neither of them were tricked into doing this. This was a decision that they both made, and they're both regretting it. In a last desperate act, Belle finally is able to land a blow on Eyes' armor. It's only a little scratch, but the point is, he did it. He was able to attack Eyes successfully. Successfully. Eyes out of patience and also mentally break down, we'll get to that in the Loki Familia, then tells Belle that her blade is sharp and it will hurt. So she's finally decided to actually attack Belle, something that she just doesn't want to do, but decided it's the only way. That's when Ween appears. She should have been running away, but she decided she didn't want to do that. She wanted to protect Belle. She wanted to be with Belle. And so she stood between Belle and Eyes. She's yelling at Eyes to stop hurting Belle. And Eyes' first response is to tell her to stop talking. The very idea of a talking monster just kills Eyes inside. Eyes demands, what does Ween want? And Ween tells her she just wants to be with Belle. And Eyes' response is, you can't be with Belle. Your wings scare people. Your claws hurt people. You are a monster. And as a response to that, Ween rips off her claws and then rips off her own wing. Both Belle and Eyes are completely speechless at this action. Ween then promises Eyes that if she ever goes on a rampage again, she'll disappear permanently. Eyes, at that point, turns away, drops a potion down, and tells Belle that she can't kill that wyvern anymore. Belle thinks Eyes takes the potion and carries Ween out of there. He then uses it to heal both hers and his own wounds. In the meantime, Hestia accidentally spills her drink on the Dionysus logbook. Unfortunately, it's clear just by that that this book is a fake. So the fifth entrance that the Xenos all go to isn't real. Instead, it's a completely dead end. They're trapped. And who is there? It's Hermes with Asfi. Hermes then speaks with the Xenos and Faust, and he's pissed because Bell gave up everything that he worked so hard to create for the Xenos, and that just doesn't work. It goes against a god's plan, and that's not something that Hermes can accept. And so he makes an offer, which isn't really an offer, he's basically forcing them to sacrifice some of the Xenos in exchange for the rest of them surviving. So one of the doors that the Loki family was guarding, Hermes was able to get them to leave and abandon it. Hermes will tell them which door it is, in exchange, some of the Xenos must attack the townspeople, sacrificing their lives by having Bell kill them and becoming a hero again. As you can imagine, Leo is completely against this, and so is Faust, but Gross actually steps forward and agrees to do it. At this point, Gross has finally accepted that Bell and the Hestia family in general really do care about them and want what's best for them and he wishes to repay his debt. In the meantime, Bell, Ween, and a few other of the straggling Xenos went to an actual fifth entrance to Noxus in Daedalus Street, because, thanks to Dix informing him that the barbarian that was killed near the orphanage was a Xeno, that means it had to have gotten there through Noxus. So all Bell had to do was just blast a few walls, and there you go, the entrance to Noxus. He says bye to Ween again, but this time, she doesn't cry. It's a proper goodbye where the two of them know they're going to see each other again. That's when Belle goes up to the surface to see what's going on. And he finds out that Gross and a few other of the falling monsters are attacking the refugee camps housing the civilians of Daedalus Street. Belle tries to communicate with Gross, see what's going on, but obviously he's ignoring him. He's doing his role. And then his target appears. So Hermes gave Ina a bracelet that cannot be removed that will react to a magic stone that was given to Gross by Hermes. And so Gross was ordered by Hermes to attack the woman wearing the bracelet. Because Ina is, is important to Belle, this will force Belle to kill Gross. Hermes, the entire time, is hooting and hollering and celebrating the fact that he's going to finally create his true hero that he's always wanted, that the world always wanted. Hestia, being able to read the mood of a situation, immediately is able to tell that Hermes is fucking around again. The Xenos that are attacking the civilian population are the work of Hermes himself. 
Arahime asks what they can do to help to stop this from happening, but Hestia isn't worried. She basically tells them Belle will figure it out. She trusts him to make the right choice. So, after a little bit of fighting with Belle, Gross finally makes his final charge. He goes straight for Ina, forcing Belle to put himself between the two of them and have to make the choice, either let Ina die or kill Gross. Belle is about to actually kill Gross when he remembers something that his grandfather told him when he was younger. Don't let anyone decide for you. Not even a god. This is your story. And Belle sheathes his knife and then just spreads his arms wide out, waiting for Gross's attack. And Gross obviously doesn't attack. He pulls back. This really pissed off Hermes, because Belle found a third option. He didn't let Ina die, and he didn't kill Gross. He found a way to save them both. And that was not something that Hermes could accept. So he then tells Ina to basically inject Gross with a drug that will make him go on a rampage. But before she's able to do that, everyone senses danger. Everyone senses death coming because a giant fucking minotaur is smashing through building, charging straight at Belle. Belle grabs Ina, tosses her to the side, and then tries to block the minotaur's attack head on, and he slammed through multiple buildings. Belle dusts himself off, stands back up, and the minotaur starts talking. It informs him that he has a dream every night. A dream where he's in combat with the greatest warrior, one that will never run away, none will, that will never stop. An ultimate fight to the death. And this dream of his always ends the same way, with a flash of lightning, which is why he named himself Asterius, which means lightning. Bell immediately realizes that this is the Minotaur that he fought that led to his level 2. Asterius asks for his name, Bell gives it. Asterius only has one thing to ask, will you grant me a rematch? The first thought that goes through Bell's mind is that this would make a great distraction for the other Zenos to escape, but then he immediately thinks to himself, no, this is an opponent that came back from the dead to fight him. They're missing an arm, they're covered in wounds, and they still want to fight. They still want this rematch. It would be dishonorable of him to just treat it as an escape plan. No, what Bell is going to do is that he is going to fight, and he is going to fight to win. And these two just start going at it like crazy, trying to kill each other, basically. Bell's actively attacking his wounded side, so this way he has some kind of advantage, because even though Asterius is heavily wounded, he's still a level 7, so he has the advantage over Bell. In the middle of the fighting, they end up back to where the refugees are being held, and there's a massive smash of the ground, leaving the dust flying everywhere. And all around them are adventurers and civilians, and Asterius basically just knocks anyone out of his way who are just in his way. He doesn't any see any reason to waste his time with the weak, and he's about to actually trample over the orphans that Bell knows. That's when Bell regains himself, jumps and attacks Asterius, and their duel continues. One of the leaders of the orphans wants to cheer for Bell. He wants to cheer for his hero, but because of all the mean things he said to him before, he feels like it's wrong to do that, that he doesn't deserve to cheer for Bell. That's when he hears two people cheering on Bell. The first person is Lethia, and the second is Mord. And this gives the boy the courage to cheer for Bell. And next thing you know, the entire city is cheering on Bell to defeat the Minotaur. Bell gets his hand on a long sword, thanks to Otter, and the fight is able to escalate to a new level. Eventually, their fight leads them all the way to the town square. At this point, Hermes doesn't even care anymore. In fact, he actually laughs at himself and calls out to the sky, Zeus, did you know this would happen? Did you know that there was a mortal that could defy the gods? Is that why you left us? Bell and Asterius decide to have their final clash. Bell, charging Argonaut into the longsword, thinks of thinks of the hero Argonaut. And just like in their first fight, this one once again rekindles the fire in Bell in his desire to be a hero. The two have their final clash. Bell loses. He's launched into the air. Asterius is able to catch Bell with his elbow, drags him through the ground, tosses him through the ground of Babel into the first floor of the dungeon. Bell had lost. Asterius then jumps down to where Bell is at, tells him that they're even now, and their next fight will be their last. Bell, while lying there, thinks to himself, well, the other Zenos had to have gotten away. That's good. I'm happy that happened. But then admits that's a lie, and that he was trying to win, that he wanted to win. Bell really wants to be a hero, and that dream just feels so far away right now. And Bell begins to cry. Ina, who is watching the entire fight, finally makes it down to Bell, kneels down to him, and holds his hand to comfort him in this loss. When it's all said and done, all the Zenos were successfully able to get back down. Asterius had his arm reattached. The city no longer hates Bell. In fact, he is now seen as a great hero who went one-on-one -on -one with a giant monster that brought fear to even other adventurers. And this whole ordeal with the Zenos gave Bell two more goals. Originally, he wanted to stand by eyes. Then, he, he wanted to stand by eyes and become a hero. 
Now, he wants those two things. He wants to save the Zenos so they can walk alongside humanity. And finally, feed his rival. The last loose end for Bell is Eyes. He's just wandering around one day. He decides to go up to their training spot, just hoping she's there. And she is. She asked why he's there. Her response was she felt like he would be here. So the two of them were looking for each other, basically. They don't say much. All Bell says is he wants to get stronger. She says, all right. He then asks, will you train me? She asks him if that's all right still. He says yes. And so she agrees. So even after all they went through and all they did to one another, they still truly care for one another. And they're naturally now closer than ever before. All right. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. Give a thumbs up so you can more down watching other my things. Thank you and have a great day.